One culture and the new sensibility. In the last few years, there has been a good deal of discussion of a purported chasm which opened up some two centuries ago with the advent of the Industrial Revolution between two cultures, the literary, artistic, and the scientific. According to this diagnosis, any intelligent and articulate modern person is likely to inhabit one culture to the exclusion of the other. He will be concerned with different documents, different techniques, different problems. He will speak a different language. Most important, the type of effort required for the mastery of these two cultures will differ vastly. For the literary artistic culture is understood as a general culture. It is addressed to man insofar as he is man. It is culture, or rather it promotes culture, in the sense of culture defined by Ortega y Gasset, that which a man has in his possession when he has forgotten everything that he has read. The scientific culture, in contrast, is a culture for specialists. It is founded on remembering and is set down in ways that require complete dedication of the effort to comprehend. While the literary artistic culture aims at internalization, ingestion, in other words, cultivation, the scientific culture aims at accumulation and externalization in complex instruments for problem solving and specific techniques for mastery. Though T.S. Eliot derived the chasm between the two cultures from a period more remote in modern history, speaking in a famous essay of a dissociation of sensibility which opened up in the 17th century, the connection of the problem with the Industrial Revolution seems well taken. There is a historic antipathy on the part of many literary intellectuals and artists to those changes which characterize modern society. Above all, industrialization and those of its effects which everyone has experienced, such as the proliferation of huge, impersonal cities and the predominance of the anonymous style of urban life. It has mattered little whether industrialization, the creature of modern science, is seen on the 19th and early 20th century model as noisy, smoky, artificial processes which defile nature and standardize culture or on the newer model, the clean, automated technology that is coming into being in the second half of the 20th century. The judgment has been mostly the same. Literary men feeling that the status of humanity itself was being challenged by the new science and the new technology abhorred and deplored the change. Both the literary men, whether one thinks of Emerson and Thoreau and Ruskin in the 19th century or of 20th century intellectuals who talk of modern society, as being in some new way incomprehensible, alienated, are inevitably on the defensive. They know that the scientific culture, the coming of the machine, cannot be stopped. The standard response to the problem of the two cultures and the issue long antedates by many decades the crude and philistine statement of the problem by C.P. Snow in a famous lecture some years ago has been a facile defense of the function of the arts in terms of an ever vaguer ideology of humanism or a premature surrender of the function of the arts to science. By the second response, I am not referring to the philistinism of scientists and those of their party among artists and philosophers who dismiss the arts as imprecise, untrue, at best mere toys. I am speaking of serious doubts which have arisen among those who are passionately engaged in the arts. The role of the individual artist in the business of making unique objects for the purpose of giving pleasure and educating conscience and sensibility has repeatedly been called into question. Some literary intellectuals and artists have gone so far as to prophesy the ultimate demise of the art-making activity of man. Art in an automated scientific society would be unfunctional, useless. But this conclusion, I should argue, is plainly unwarranted. Indeed, the whole issue seems to me crudely put. For the question of the two cultures assumes that science and technology are changing, in motion, while the arts are static, fulfilling some perennial generic human function, consolation, edification, diversion. Only on the basis of this false assumption would anyone reason that the arts might be in danger of becoming obsolete. Art does not progress in the sense that science and technology do, but the arts do develop and change. For instance, in our own time, art is becoming increasingly the terrain of specialists. The most interesting and creative art of our time is not open to the generally educated. It demands special effort. It speaks a specialized language. 
the music of Milton Babbitt and Morton Feldman, the painting of Mark Rothko and Frank Stella, the dance of Merce Cunningham and James Waring demand an education of sensibilities whose difficulties in length of apprenticeship are at least comparable to the difficulties of mastering physics or engineering. Only the novel among the arts, at least in America, fails to provide similar examples. The parallel between the abstruseness of contemporary art and that of modern science is too obvious to be missed. Another likeness to the scientific culture is the history-mindedness of contemporary art. The most interesting works of contemporary art are full of references to the history of the medium. So far as they comment on past art, they demand a knowledge of at least the recent past. As Harold Rosenberg has pointed out, contemporary paintings are themselves acts of criticism as much of as creation. As much as of creation. Let me read that again. As Harold Rosenberg has pointed out, contemporary paintings are themselves acts of criticism as much as of creation. The point could be made as well of much recent work in the films, music, the dance, poetry, and in Europe literature. Again, a similarity with the style of science, this time with the accumulative aspect of science, can be discerned. The conflict between the two cultures is in fact an illusion, a temporary phenomenon born of a period of profound and bewildering historical change. What we are witnessing is not so much a conflict of cultures as the creation of a new, potentially unitary, kind of sensibility. This new sensibility is rooted, as it must be, in our experience, experiences which are new in the history of humanity, in extreme social and physical mobility, in the crowdedness of the human scene, both people and material commodities multiplying at a dizzying rate, in the availability of new sensations such as speed, physical speed as in airplane travel, speed of images as in the cinema, and in the pan-cultural perspective on the arts that is possible through the mass reproduction of art objects. What we are getting is not the demise of art, but a transformation of the function of art. Art which arose in human society as a magical religious operation and passed over into a technique for depicting and commenting on secular reality has in our own time arrogated to itself a new function. Neither religious nor serving a secularized religious function, nor merely secular or profane, a notion which breaks down when it's opposite, the religious or sacred, becomes obsolescent. Art today is a new kind of instrument, an instrument for modifying consciousness and organizing new modes of sensibility, and the means for practicing art have been radically extended. Indeed, in response to this new function, more felt than clearly articulated, artists have had to become self-conscious estheticians, continually challenging their means, their materials, and methods. Often the conquest and exploitation of new materials and methods drawn from the world of non-art, for example, from industrial technology, from commercial processes and imagery, from purely private and subjective fantasies and dreams, seems to be the principal effort of many artists. Painters no longer feel themselves confined to canvas and paint, but employ hair, photographs, wax, sand, bicycle tires, their own toothbrushes and socks. Musicians have reached beyond the sounds of the traditional instruments to use tampered instruments and usually on tape, synthetic sounds and industrial noises. All kinds of conventionally accepted boundaries have thereby been challenged, and not just the one between the scientific and the literary artistic cultures or the one between art and non-art, but also many established distinctions within the world of culture itself, that between form and content, the frivolous and the serious, and a favorite of literary intellectuals, high and low culture. The distinction between high and low, or mass or popular, culture is based partly on an evaluation of the difference between unique and mass-produced objects. 
In an era of mass technological reproduction, the work of the serious artist had a special value simply because it was unique, because it bore his personal individual signature. The works of popular culture and even films were for a long time included in this category were seen as having little value because they were manufactured objects bearing no individual stamp, group concoctions made for an undifferentiated audience. But in the light of contemporary practice in the arts, this distinction appears extremely shallow. Many of the serious works of art of recent decades have a decidedly impersonal character. The work of art is reasserting its existence as object, even as manufactured or mass-produced object, drawing on the popular arts, rather than as individual personal expression. The exploration of the impersonal and transpersonal in con contemporary art is the new classicism, at least a reaction against what is understood as the romantic spirit dominates most of the interesting art of today. Today's art, with its insistence on coolness, its refusal of what it considers to be sentimentality, its spirit of exactness, its sense of research and problems is closer to the spirit of science than of art in the old-fashioned sense. Often the artist's work is only his idea, his concept. This is a familiar practice in architecture, of course, and one remembers that painters in the Renaissance often left parts of their canvases to be worked out by students, and that in the flourishing period of the concerto, the cadenza at the end of the first movement was left to the inventiveness and discretion of the performing soloist. But similar practices have a different, more polemical meaning today in the present post-romantic era of the arts. When painters such as Joseph Albers, Ellsworth Kelly, and Andy Warhol assign portions of the work, say the painting in of the colors themselves to a friend or the local gardener, when musicians such as Stockhausen, John Cage, and Luigi Nono invite collaboration from performers by leaving opportunities for random effects, switching around the order of the score and, impro and improvisations, they are changing the ground rules which most of us employ to recognize a work of art. They are saying what art need not be, at least not necessarily. The primary feature of the new sensibility is that its model product is not the literary work, above all, the novel. A new non-literary culture exists today of whose very existence, not to mention significance, most literary intellectuals are entirely unaware. This new establishment includes certain painters, sculptors, architects, social planners, filmmakers, TV technicians, neurologists, musicians, electronics engineers, dancers, philosophers, and sociologists. A few poets and prose writers can be included. Some of the basic texts for this new cultural alignment are to be found in the writings of Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, Antonin Artaud, C.S. Sherrington, Buckminster Fuller, Marshall McLuhan, John Cage, Andre Breton, Roland Barthes, Claude Levi Strauss, Siegfried Giddon, Norman O'Brown, and Georgie Kepps. Those who worry about the gap between the two cultures, and this means virtually all literary intellectuals in England and America, take for granted a notion of culture which decidedly needs re-examining. It is the notion perhaps best expressed by Matthew Arnold in which the central cultural act is the making of literature, which is itself understood as the criticism of culture simply ignorant of the vital and enthralling so-called avant-garde developments in, uh, in the other arts, and blinded by their personal investment in the perpetuation of the older notion of culture. They continue to cling to literature as the model for a creative statement. What gives literature its preeminence is its heavy burden of content both reportage and moral judgment. This makes it possible for most English and American literary critics to use literary works mainly as texts, or even pretexts, for social and cultural diagnosis. Rather than concentrating on the properties of, say, a given novel or a play as an artwork. But the model arts of our time are actually those with much less content and a much cooler mode of moral judgment, like music, films, dance, architecture, painting, sculpture. The practice of these arts, all of which draw profusely, naturally, and without embarrassment upon science and technology, are the locus of the new sensibility.
The problem of the two cultures, in short, rests upon an uneducated, uncontemporary grasp of our present cultural situation. It arises from the ignorance of literary intellectuals and of scientists with a shallow knowledge of the arts, like the scientist novelist C.P. Snow himself, of a new culture and its emerging sensibility. In fact, there can be no divorce between science and technology on the one hand and art on the other any more than there can be a divorce between art and the forms of social life. Works of art, psychological forms, and social forms all reflect each other and change with each other. But of course, most people are slow to come to terms with such changes, especially today when the changes are occurring with an unprecedented rapidity. Marshall McLuhan has described human history as a succession of acts of technological extension of human capacity, each of which works a radical change upon our environment and our ways of thinking, feeling, and valuing. The tendency, he remarks, is to upgrade the old environment into art form. Thus, nature became a vessel of aesthetic and spiritual values in the new industrial environment. While the new conditions are regarded as corrupt and degrading, typically, it is only certain artists in any given era who have the resources and temerity to live in the immediate contact with the environment of their age. That is why they may seem to be ahead of their time. More timid people prefer to accept the previous environment's values as the continuing reality of their time. Our natural bias as to accept the new gimmick, our natural bias is to accept the new gimmick, automation say, as a thing that be can be accommodated in the old ethical order. Only in the terms of what McLuhan calls the old ethical order does the problem of the two cultures appear to be a genuine problem. It is not a problem for most of the creative artists of our time, among whom one could include very few novelists, because most of these artists have broken, whether they know it or not, with the Matthew Arnold notion of culture, finding it historically and humanly obsolescent.